Hi, everybody. I'm Kathy Aronson, and I'm here to give you the IETF report. So this presentation, like I've said in the past, um, it, this one covers IETF 108 and 107. A couple of interim meetings that I attended that weren't during those meetings. And also, there's a little bit from the last in-person meeting, which was last November. It's not in depth. It's even less in depth than it, than it has been in the past because I only have 20 minutes. Um, I hope you enjoy it. I'd love your feedback. That would be awesome. Also, I have some extra slides past the very last slide that I'm going to present that are things that I don't have time to cover, but you might be interested in. So take a look at that. So this is the first ever totally virtual IETF was 107. Um, so I don't have as many crazy photos of people choose. I do have a couple of um, virtual IETF photos. Uh, I did take these all the other ones at IETF 106. And the other highlight is there's a virtual hum tool. So in Aaron, we do a show of hands. At IETF, we do a hum. And um, I wasn't in a working group that used the virtual hum tool, but I'm excited to see how that's going to work out. The other really funny thing is the Meet Echo at IETF 108. Um, the first couple of days, it ended the meeting right on time. So like it literally shut down at the end of the meeting which actually makes the um, working group chairs a little bit more prompt. This is what happens when you have virtual meetings and your, your kitty cat really wants you to not be in a virtual meeting. And this is what I call the Meet Echo Tunnel. So at the beginning of IETF 108, the beginning of working groups, we would have this sort of vortex. And then when the meeting got started, somehow they made it go away. So some interesting data on virtual IETF 107, there were 701 individuals that participated from 39 countries and IETF 108 with the Meet Echo and more formal announcements had a lot more people. I'm really interested to find out um, if there are countries that are participating or people that are participating that couldn't in the, couldn't in the past because they couldn't travel and this is more equal for participants to participate. So the IEPG slides are from the November IETF, the, the last in-person IETF, but I included them because I think that you'll find them interesting. And IEPG is a network operator group that meets before IETFs. Um, and it's met since the 90s, even though people don't seem to know that it exists. So the FORT project is an I, LACNIC initiative that's a, it's an RPKI validator. And I thought it's open source. So right now it's focused on the LACNIC region, but you could go and get it and use it in your region or wherever you are to verify the RPKI. So I thought it was interesting. There's a URL there. So Jeff Houston gave this really interesting talk about no in the DNS. So if you issue a query for something that doesn't exist and you get a no back that it doesn't exist, you would think that you wouldn't continue to query, but on average, if you get a no back, you still issue 2.37 queries for the non-existent domain, which is kind of scary. And um, if it does exist, then you still issue, you get a yes, you still issue more queries. And if it's signed, it takes a little bit longer, so you issue even more queries. I think sometimes I'm amazed that <laughs> the internet works at all. So V6 operations, is the group that deals with the v6 protocol being deployed and interacting with v4. So this was my very favorite talk of all of these virtual meetings. Jen Lakova has a v6 only network and she made a v6 only SSID and then encouraged folks by offering a raffle and contest and prizes for folks who found bugs. So they were looking for the percentage of users that really need IPv4. Is a dedicated fallback network required? How much of space could they save? Various other things. A lot of bugs were found. 5% of the users went back to V4, which is just a small amount. And a bunch of things broke. The treadmills all broke because they only do V4. So the Spotify app broke. StarCraft 2, which I'm sure is mission critical, broke. Um, they saved a bunch of address space. So the lessons they learned, you can't just, you know, just turning off V6 isn't super helpful because eventually you're going to have to go to V6. 
And if you keep V4 on all the time, it masquerades a lot of the, it, it hides a lot of the problems. Like we've, you know, early on with cell phones, we found that, you, you know, you could do the software update would happen over V6, but you couldn't request it unless you had V4. So until you turn off V4, you don't really see what the problems really are. A couple of years ago, Jen had the IETF turn off IPv6 during the uh, v6 operations working group and it was just it was really horrible a lot of stuff was broken but a lot of bugs got fixed most people don't ever really say I need IPv6 but and they don't really care what the roads made out of as long as it it works so if the SSID works then they're going to use it so this is v6 deployment in China um, they've got a lot of v6 going on there 160.3 million active users are all on v6 um, they have problems with cpus transition of content the things that you would expect and the measurements from outside of china look lower than their internal reports which isn't a, a huge surprise i'm not really sure about this car but i had to take a picture of it it, it was in singapore so V6 maintenance is the group that deals with the, the nitty gritty changes to the protocol specification itself, as opposed to the deployment of V6. So this is, uh, they're trying to improve the robustness of stateless auto configuration and how long a, a prefix should be valid, um, what multiple of, of time frames, and those sorts of things. This exists because home net never really happened. So they're looking at how do you make a sub network auto configure when you connect it to the network because you can't really buy a home net router and have your home configure itself. So this isn't a standard working on trying to solve that problem because home net really didn't solve that problem. This is more extension headers. I've talked about this before where a lot of packets with extension headers get dropped, but they still keep making extension headers. And this is sort of extension headers kind of on steroids. They want to be able to insert them and remove them while the packet's in flight, which breaks like a whole bunch of things. We talked before about Igor's draft uh, where attackers were doing port scans of V6 address ranges, and it was basically a denial of service attack because a lot of things broke when you scan that many hosts. You know, a slash 64 has 1.844 times 10 to the 19th addresses, and that's like a regular subnet. So what this draft is looking at is a way that you can know which hosts are on your network so you can test them for vulnerabilities. So there's this idea of a collection point where the router advertises a collection point in the router advertisement. And when a host gets it, it says, oh, there's a collection point. I need to send it my address. So the network administrator then knows, oh, these are all the active addresses on the network. So I can look to see if they're vulnerable. It, it doesn't really prevent the, somebody trying to scan all of them, but at least it lets a network administrator know what's on his network. When I travel, I really like to go to foreign grocery stores, and this was a shot from Singapore. CIDR operations is all things secure interdomain routing, BGP SAC, and validation of routes. Okay, so the reason I've included this slide is because I always look for things that would affect the RIRs directly, and this draft requires all of the RIRs to publish origin AS0 for any unallocated or unassigned address space in order for this protocol change to work. And that would be a ton of work for the RIRs. And the good news is this isn't popular, but I still thought I should raise it with everybody and let them know that this is being uh, proposed so that the RIR community would know. So there were some hijacks during the summer of 2020 at where somebody takes a, a valid autonomous system number and masquerades as it. And in that process, they discovered that origin validation really isn't sufficient. That if you, when, when these attacks happen, 
they use a real AS number and not necessarily a prefix that is used by that ISP. And so when they try to validate it, they get not found. And a bunch of most not found routes are actually used in the route selection. So they propose this uh, row as exists for all prefixes. So as an ISP, I can say I have a ROA for every one of my prefixes. So if you get a prefix from me that doesn't have a ROA, then it's invalid. And then it gets marked as invalid and it's not used, which helps with these sorts of attacks. This is a relying party measurement presentation that wasn't presented at the meeting, but when I was looking through the slides, I thought they were interesting. Um, it can take a, from a minute to an hour for the relying party to synchronize on what's out there and the, um, what's validated. And they don't look at all the certificate authorities, so they don't necessarily have a complete view of the uh, RPKI. Lost in translation, that's all I can say about that. So global access to the internet for all is where all the community networks hide out. So when I was on the Aaron Advisory Council, we, we wrote policies for community networks and we were always trying to figure out, you know, are our community networks gonna use this? Do they exist? And this is where you find them. So if you need to find a community network, you go to this working group. This is a information about a rural South African network. They, um, they operate on a very, very small budget with a lot of people and they are right now dealing with fake news about um, COVID and they have a lot of things that aren't in their native language. So they've started asking people to provide their own stories of their experiences with COVID so that, you know, they have stuff in their native language that's real and what's going on. And most of these people live on a dollar a day, which is this is a, a network in North Macedonia that's looking at the soup to nuts, the energy that's required from making of the hardware to running their network and how they can sustainably run their network. I, I don't even know what to say about that hat, but this is more IETF background noise. So human rights on the internet, I started going to because I didn't really understand that protocols could affect human rights. I don't know. I, I just thought it was interesting to uh, attend and check it out. So right now in Ireland, they have an app to, to do COVID tracing and they're, they have to require that you can freely opt in and opt out, but still they had a million downloads in about a day and 60% of the users in Ireland are using this tracing app. So SHMU, Stay Home, Meet Only Online, is their work that's being done for, you know, how do you decide if there's gonna be a meeting in person or not in person? What are the criteria? When is it worthwhile? The number of participants you need to make it worthwhile. And I'd really like to see all of us start talking about what happens when some people can meet in person, but not everybody. Maybe you have a health problem or you're older or whatever. How do we make parity? Because we all know that the remote participation exists, but it's certainly not equal to meeting in person. Um, the Meet Echo that the IETF uses for the meetings is really, it's really great. Um, there's, it's, it's more orderly. The room's never too hot or too cold, unless I make it too hot or too cold. I mean, it's hard to not see everybody, but it actually is easier to hear, it's easier to see. And how do we continue that going forward? The mailing list for SHMU is many couches, which always makes me laugh. Um, let's see, they're looking at, to, you know, rethinking the meetings. The other thing they're thinking about is, do they have um, a, like a meeting in San Francisco and a meeting in Europe and like interconnect them somehow? Meet Echo has a virtual lounge that you have a little avatar and you walk around and you can meet with people and virtually sit at tables, which is, I don't know, I didn't, I didn't get a chance to use it. I went in and checked it out. So they're also talking about technology requirements. Should we use Jabber? Is it outdated? 
Um, what other things can we do? There's a lot of talk about dog food, which is basically the IETF using IETF standards like, you know, using B6 and turning off B4, that sort of thing. The IETF meetings have started doing these deep dives of technology. I've talked about some of these before. This one was a DNS one. And although Jeff didn't talk about his no talk at this, he did talk about how to make resilience in the DNS, um, how to engineer it. Joao talked about the different software solutions that are used for DNS and root resolvers and all that sort of thing. Next slide. Dispatch is a group I don't really ever go to, but I did because I had some spare time. And it's the overarching working group for the applications in real time area. And they're talking about forming a group for email security because email is still the number one service on the internet and hacks are apparently at an all time high. So um, that's something to keep an eye on. I'll probably keep following that as time goes on. So if you're going to go to an IETF, these are some good places to look for more information about BOSS and upcoming agenda and those sorts of things. And I'd like to also say, I don't think I said it in the beginning, that some of these slides are from interim meetings or the in-person meeting. And if you're looking it up and you can't find it, let me know because um, like V6 Ops was an interim meeting and some of the stuff was from November in person. There's a video you can watch that tells you how to be a good newcomer at IETF. And if you're a woman attending your first IETF, the sisters group is really supportive and super helpful. So if anybody has any questions, that would be great. And remember, pass this slide in the deck that'll be online are slides that I didn't cover. A lot of the stuff is redundant that we've covered before with just updates and those sorts of things. Thanks a lot. My special thanks to Kathy, you know, to we, we had to ask all presenters to shrink their time down and to present two and a half updates and half the normal time. Uh, appreciate her squeezing that in. <laughs> So we do have some questions in queue. Kathy, I know you're, uh, I believe you're out there to answer them. So um, I'll ask them and you can respond. Um, first one is um, uh, Azale oh. Fernandez. What has been the IPv6 only experiences during the last IETF meetings? Has it improved less broken things following every meeting? Um, well, they don't generally turn off V6 in working groups and make you only use V4, but there are v V6 only SSIDs and people use them and they seem to work. I think that going forward, if we are meeting in person, they probably should turn it off, turn V4 off and see what else breaks, but it is getting better. I also wanted to mention real quick that if you are interested in the next virtual IETF, which is in November, um, but maybe you don't have a sponsor to pay the registration fee, which is early birds like $230 maybe, um, you can, there's a fee waiver program and they, they're pretty lenient. So if you're interested, check that out um, on the IETF.org website. I don't know if there are other questions. There's one more question, uh, or more of a statement from Owen DeLong, who's with Farsight Security and the RNAC. He just notes that ASO zero policies are already being circulated in all of the RIRs, uh, so the IETF work will be a no-op by the time it comes to fruition, if it does it anyway. Yeah, I kind of figured, I mean, it, was super it wasn't super popular at the IETF, but again, anything that that makes the RIRs do anything is always something I'm gonna put in the slides <laughs> because that's why I'm there, so. Excellent. Uh, do we have anyone in queue? I just wanna see, we might have someone speaking, no? I don't see any speakers. I don't see uh, any questions. Um, Paul, did you wanna say something? 
Nope, I was just saying that there was no hands raised. Okay, uh, in which case, I just want to say thank you, Kathy. A little round of applause for Kathy. And we'll now resume our program. Thanks again, Kathy. Awesome.